Hi everyone, excellent to be with you again this morning. We're in the middle of a series uh, of stories in John's Gospel about encountering Jesus. And we're doing this series because we believe what the Bible says, that faith in Jesus as Lord and Saviour transforms not only life to come, it transforms life here and now, every single part of it. This morning our title from John chapter 4 is Encountering Living Water. We've got a remarkable, fascinating story today of compassion, of Jesus reaching across multiple divides to reveal to a, a most unexpected person just who he is and that he is the only one who can quench the thirst of the human soul. The scene is this, that Jesus and his disciples are in the south in Judea and they need to travel back to the north to Galilee. It will take them about a week or so. Here's what we read in John chapter 4, starting at verse 4. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sukkah, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? In brackets, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to get water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I, I can see you're a prophet. Uh, well, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, well, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then decisively, Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. There's so much in this passage, but I want to look at two things. Firstly, that this woman matters to Jesus. And then secondly, that Jesus alone can satisfy this woman's thirsty soul. Firstly, this woman matters to Jesus. See, John, John tells each of these encounter stories to reveal more of Jesus to his readers and to us. And the simple fact, the first thing to note really, is simply that Jesus is both tired and thirsty. John's gospel clearly portrays the divinity of Jesus, that he is fully God. That's the focus. But even here in this passage, it's clear that Jesus is also fully human. It's a basic fundamental tenet of the Christian faith that Jesus is fully divine and fully human, never compromising one or the other, never diluting one or the other. He's fully human here. He's tired. He's thirsty. So he says to her, verse 7, will you give me a drink? Well, her reply reveals a lot about what's going on here. 
which in turn will show us who Jesus is and what he's like, which is what John is after here. She says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John adds an explanatory note for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. A different, more modern translation of the Bible puts it like this. Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. There's a lot of hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. Imagine, by way of contrast, the utter hostility for many years between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland. Imagine the Middle East conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in recent decades. Or the utter hatred between Tutsis and Hutus in 1994 Rwanda. There's a lot of animosity here and it stems from centuries before when the Northern Kingdom split from the Southern Kingdom and then a couple of hundred years later when um, Assyria invaded Israel, took all the important people away, repopulated it with all sorts of peoples. And over time, what happened was, of course, there was intermarrying going on. And the Jews in the south, who felt themselves to be very pure, really despised those in the north who had intermarried and thought they'd watered down the true religion of Israel. They ended up, the Samaritans, only taking the first part of the scriptures, not the whole of them. They ended up having their own temple on Mount Gerizim and didn't care for the temple in Jerusalem they absolutely despised each other one writer says this of centuries later but still before Jesus time in 128 BC the Jews went north and destroyed the Samaritan temple and ravaged the territory and then around the time of Jesus birth a band of Samaritans in the north profaned the temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish holy place, by scattering the bones of dead people in the sanctuary. Carnage. They hate each other, these two groups of people. So Jesus is stepping into really dangerous territory here in many ways. Here, are the, here they are. He's a man talking to a woman. In their culture, that is a really big deal. You don't do that especially because he's alone with her in public. You really don't do that. He's a Jew fraternising with a Samaritan. Again, you don't do that. We've just explained why. And he's a Jew who, in asking her for a drink, surely in Jewish ways, will become defiled by drinking from an unclean water container from the Samaritan. You just don't do this. So Jesus is crossing a lot of societal boundaries. He's risking his reputation, in fact. You've got to ask, why is he doing this? He's doing it for this simple but profound reason, that this woman matters to Jesus. That, I think, is at least part of what we're told in verse 4, where we read that he had to go. Remember, he was going from Judea through to, Sam through to uh, Galilee in the north. It said he had to go through Samaria. Well, that's kind of true geographically and not necessarily true geographically. See, there were two routes from Judea to Galilee. You could go straight through Samaria or you could go just to the west of the Jordan, which was often a route that Jews would take to avoid Samaria and that whole region. But he had to go there. I think John's telling us something more because his father had an appointment for Jesus with this woman at the well. She matters to Jesus. You matter to Jesus. You matter enough to Jesus that he would come to wherever you are and cross all sorts of divides. Things that keep you from him things like your sin, and he goes to the cross and crosses the great divide because you matter to him. And this Samaritan woman seems to matter to Jesus even though she appears to have a questionable past. You see, the text tells us that she's come at midday to draw water. Well, that was very unusual. It was a woman's task to get the water. And they would come either early in the morning or late in the evening to avoid the midday heat and they would come as a group. She's come alone in the heat of the day. The clear implication 
is that she's not welcome amongst the rest of her community, which is probably to do with the fact she's had multiple husbands, as we're told later in the passage. I think it's fascinating. See, we might have respect, we might have expected respectable, upstanding Nicodemus in chapter three to matter to Jesus, but this very next encounter with Jesus that John tells us is the complete opposite. Nicodemus, respectable, matters to Jesus. This woman at the other end of society, not even in the Jewish society, she matters to Jesus too. And then he shocks her with his divine knowledge about her. He says, the fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. She's astonished. She's horrified, probably wondering, who's told you? How did you find that out? How do you know about me? Who knows what's happened? Lots of speculation. Perhaps she's been divorced five times. Perhaps she's been widowed five times. Perhaps she's been unfaithful five times. But either way, she's ostracised from the rest of her community. Whether she's been mistreated, unfortunate or immoral, Jesus cares for her. Whether others have left her, died on her or despised her, Jesus has come out of perhaps his natural way to this very point to meet her at the well so she can encounter God's love for her and the living water that he offers. If you're not a Christian yet watching this today, let me tell you, if you get nothing else, know this, you matter to God. And if you're a Christian today, let me remind you, you matter to God. Perhaps you've wondered about that lately. Maybe things have not turned out as you wanted. Perhaps you've wondered where God is at the moment. Let me just remind you, this story and so much else helps us to know you matter to God. This woman matters to God. And then secondly, Jesus alone can satisfy this woman's thirst. You see, the initial conversation about Jesus' need for water leads to recognition of this woman's far greater need for living water. She needs not just fresh running water, but something that will quench her soul, her deep thirst for peace, contentment and acceptance, which, let's be honest, it's where we're all at. All the world is looking for peace, contentment and acceptance. And like this woman, when the serious matters get talked about, we might try to deflect from addressing our greatest needs with our version of talking about worship on this mountain or that mountain. But each one of us is desperately seeking something that truly satisfies the thirst of our soul. That's how advertising works. Promising to quench your thirst. That's how addiction works. Promising to deliver relief or a temporary high. It's how much of our society works, but it's all a mirage. You might feel like you've got it, but it just vanishes in a puff of smoke. It's all a mirage. It's never able to truly satisfy whatever it promises. And Jesus says to her, verse 14, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Well, she hasn't quite understood yet, so she naturally says to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. She thinks perhaps he's found a secret water supply and maybe she can be saved a little bit of labour, uh, particularly in the noonday heat, to keep coming and getting water. That's not what Jesus is talking about. You see, water, living water, it's a common Old Testament theme. And Jesus, just three chapters later, very interestingly says this. There's been a great festival. And on the last and greatest day of the festival, John 7 tells us, 
Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus is not just offering a better temporary water supply, as it were, for this woman. He is offering an eternal supply to satisfy her soul that he will place in her that will bubble up and keep flowing and never run out. And then here is the big point of this passage. The living water is Jesus himself as a gift. You can't earn this water. You can't earn eternal life. It's a gift and the gift is Jesus himself. You see, Jesus is not just a religious teacher telling us to go to this temple or go to that holy place and find somehow there some contentment. He isn't some teacher of vague spirituality that is so prevalent these days, sort of saying, muster up some, some inner worth, find yourself from within. He's not saying that at all. And he's certainly not a self-help teacher offering a few tips on here's how you can find peace and contentment in life. No, he is the gift. He is the living water. He alone is the one who can satisfy our thirst. He alone is the way to eternal life. You see, to encounter Jesus is to encounter life, is to encounter the life-giving, peace-giving, hope-giving creator and saviour of the world. To encounter Jesus is to find, like this woman eventually does, that we are loved and wanted and accepted. It's to find that life doesn't have to be a never-ending, chasing after, finding your way to a bit of satisfaction in life until, well, one day you die. Because the great I am, verse 26, has come to quench your thirst eternally. I'd like us to hear from Nat, who's going to tell us briefly her story of Jesus being enough for any situation because he is living water. So I grew up in the church and knew a lot of Bible stories and Bible verses. Um, I could probably recite all the you know, pop popular verses um, that are in the Bible, but it wasn't until a year ago when someone very close to me left that I was left with these Bible verses and what was I actually gonna do with them? Um, did I actually believe them? Did I actually believe that God was enough? Did I actually believe that God could um, sustain and provide? Um, and it wasn't until then that I had to lean on his every word and that I, I lived out his, his promises and his truths in the scriptures. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And when I was going through weak days, weak moments, you know, weak times, which happened quite often um, during this season, and I'm still going through this journey, so it still does happen, but God is our strength. God is our ever-present help in times of trouble. When we are weak, he is made strong. When we are weak, he fills us up. When we feel empty, he provides. When we feel like we can't go on, he satisfies. And um, there are so many, so many scriptures in the Bible that I've had to re reprocess and relearn and, and go over. And now I'm a living testimony that God's word is true. He really does provide. He really does satisfy. There really is joy in the midst of pain. There really is peace in the midst of chaos. And God doesn't leave you and God doesn't wait till everything's done and put together and ready to bring you joy and peace. It's in the midst. It's all in the midst. It's while it's happening, while you're in the valley, he will carry you through. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And God loves to do this. He loves to lavish um, his blessings on us and on you. 
And um, I feel like some people need to hear that this morning, that he is your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, that he is enough and he is more than enough. He's able to do immeasurably more than anything we can ask or think, and he is good. Um, and I just want to pray for us this morning. Um, Father God, I thank you, Father God, that nothing in this world can satisfy it is only you. I thank you that we can lay down our hopes, our dreams, our wants, our desires to you because you will satisfy our every need. I thank you, Father God, that we can trust you. I thank you, Father God, that your word is true. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are faithful. I thank you that you are an ever-present help in times of trouble. And Father God, I pray that you help us to believe, that you help us to believe and live out to your word. And I ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Nat. So helpful. Thank you for being honest and telling us your story. Jesus is enough and more than enough. That's living water. So let's wrap up. The, the woman in John 4 has been struggling to get by, surviving in life, and one day hoping that the deliverer, the Messiah, will come. She says, verse 25, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. But while she waits for that future day, maybe you're waiting for a future day, a better day. While she waits for that future day of answers, of hope, of some peace, the source of hope and peace is right there in front of her. Which, of course, she subsequently realises, runs into town, tells everybody there, they come to find out, and Jesus stays in this place for the next two days. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink, and rivers of living water will flow from within them. Let me ask you, are you thirsty? Are you, do you know your soul's deep need? Maybe you're not a Christian yet, but you know there's something missing. Let me tell you, you were made to know Jesus. Maybe you are a Christian and you're feeling a bit dry and it's all just a bit difficult. Let me say to you, he is still the living water that you need. His promise is that rivers will flow from within us as we trust in him in the ease of life and in the difficult stuff of life, as Nat has shared. Rivers of living water will flow. Why don't we reach out to Jesus right now? I'm going to pray for us in a moment. Maybe you'd like to close your eyes just to help you concentrate and say, Jesus, I need you. I need that living water. I remind you, you matter to him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you care for every one of us. We matter even to Almighty God. We thank you so much that you came to satisfy our deep need of forgiveness and our soul's deep need to be satisfied in you. If you know that's true for you just now, why don't you just tell him that? Holy Spirit, come and help us to find Jesus, the living water. May there be streams bubbling up in us, overflowing around us, as happened with this woman. We pray, Jesus, that you'll lead us to find you to be enough, more than enough, for every situation, now and forever. Amen. If you've been particularly spoken to this morning, if you feel like God is with you, working with you just now, I want to encourage you to click on the link and uh, go through for one-on-one -on -one prayer. A great team of people will be ready, willing, happy to pray with you about what's going on in your life just now. If you're not a Christian yet and you're sensing your need of Jesus, please click on and, uh, and we will be very happy to pray with you.